This is the lecture for European history for the 25th of April, 2022, which is a Monday. And what we have just seen are two clips that have Mussolini-ish Mussolini speeches from the uh, office. <laughs> Dwight Schrute's big speech. It is a privilege to fight. And the notion of seizing this historic moment and not ceding the motherland or anything like that, definitely Mussolini-ish. And you may, be, you may have been here uh, to see, I think it was Renault. Uh, it may have been yeah. Ethan Renault do a, an ASB speech based on that with, yes. this, with the banging of the uh, podium. Okay, good. Uh, and the second was the character John Warfen, leader of the Red Electroids from Planet 10, uh, via the Eighth Dimension in the 1985 movie Buckaroo Banzai and the Hong Kong Cavaliers versus the Eighth Dimension, which is a spoof on 1930s uh, movie serials. And you shake your head. It's a delightful movie. You should see it. It doesn't look like a delightful it's, movie. It's, oh, it's fun. But <laughs> character is, our, is, is what you are in the dark. That's, that's a quote from Mussolini. And it's true. The thing about fascism, or any effective lie, is within the lie is an element of truth. Character is what you are in the dark. When nobody is looking, are you brave? When nobody is there to reward or punish you, are you noble? When you are beset, are you your best self or do you act like a desperate animal? So all of these things, given in the Mussolini style, including at the end where he's, which, which is definitely Mussolini, crossing his arms and putting his giant yeah. chin up in the ground. No, that's, that's definitely. Uh, and he mugs for the camera. But that's, that's very Italian. Uh, what he's doing is he is whipping up the crowd, what you're noticing, uh, in order to inspire them with his inspirational ideas. So on Friday, we talked a little bit about the corporative state of Mussolini, and today we are going into Imperial Japan. Up until now, we've been dealing with basically Christian civilization. Russia is on the edge of Western civilization. It's got one foot in Europe, one foot in Asia. But it's still, for intents and purposes, part of Western civilization. In so far that the Bolsheviks have to break down Christian concepts of the individual, Christian concepts of individual life, individual souls, individual value, mercy, love, that sort of thing. In Germany, of course, they have to do that as well. We haven't talked about Germany yet. In Italy, they have to do that as well. In fact, Italy being the seat of the Roman Catholic Church. But Japan is a different animal for so many reasons. Not the least of which, of course I did, as I always do, is that from its inception, Japan has a unity that is unique among societies on this planet. The Kojiki, the Shinto myths of the origin of life, the universe, and everything, is a tale of how the gods are born and create the world and how Japan is unique in that it is the land of the awake gods. Japanese Shinto, which is their unique national religion, is animistic polytheism. What that means is, it is a religion of the world come alive. A bit like the Druids in Celtic Europe who worship articles of nature, who commune with trees and when they eat near a stream, they give thanks to the god of the stream and the river by sacrificing some food uh, before you eat uh, to the god of the stream. But in Japan, 
this notion of the world come alive is not diminished or changed over time. Shinto was, is, and probably ever shall be the thing that unifies Japan. No, that she's over there. I know that. I slowly am getting this, but the fact that we moved around didn't help. So, what is the living proof of this? Well, Japan is volcanic. The earth does come alive. It has a personality. Fujisan, or Fujisama, is uh, the mountain that overlooks Tokyo. It is an active volcano. And San means mister, and Sama means lord. Japan is a land that has tidal waves. In fact, the word tsunami is the Japanese word for tidal waves. So, from its inception, the Japanese who arrive on the islands and conquer it from the Ainu, the Caucasian peoples uh, of Hokkaido today, under their mythic emperor Jimu Tenu, are a unified people, because they have to be. The world that they inhabit is so leaping dangerous, please pass this back to Shaughnessy, that if they don't function as a unit, smoothly and together, people will die needlessly. This is why individuality is ruthlessly suppressed in Japanese society. In Japanese schools today, where they have foreigners, please again pass that back, it is a regulation that everyone have black hair. What if you don't? What if you're an American exchange student? Dye it! This is because they don't want Japanese girls who go to school to wear hair coloring. They don't want blonde, they don't want pink, they don't want any of that. So if you are going to Japan and you're an exchange student and you have brown hair, dye it black because the regulation says that everyone will have black hair. In Japan, if you're too fat, people will make fun of you. There's no fear of fat shaming someone. Everyone fat shames. Because if you're fat, it's a sign that you're out of control of certain elements of your life. And a good Japanese is expected to remain in control of themselves, at least as far as the public is concerned. You conform. You bend like a willow branch. Because if the individual does not succumb or submit to the needs of the group, the group will lose lives. Let's pass this back. This social conformism involves everyone wearing a series of masks and to be privileged to be shown what is beneath the mask is a sign of great trust and intimacy. You, you smile in public, you bow in public, you conform in public, you master all of the many different rules of the public persona and manners that Japanese are supposed to um, that are, are supposed to live up to, including how you hand somebody a business card, how your head is, where your eyes go, where your fingers go in the exchange of the business card. Everything is scripted. Now, in medieval Japan, there was a very clear reason for this. When samurai of different clans under different daimyos or medieval lords met, everything followed a ritual. It was like a dance. Everything that was said, every movement was slow and measured. Why? 
Because samurai are trained to kill immediately. Explosive violence. <clears throat> and like every dueling society, medieval Japan was a society where people became scrupulously polite. Because if you're going to die violently, better it be for a reasonable cause and not just because you were sloppy in your manners, which would get you killed in medieval Japan. So you wear a mask. You play a role. You are not yourself. You are not encouraged to be yourself. Then there's the family, where you're allowed to be a different version of yourself. Your true self is hidden behind several masks. And you don't reveal it, except in very rare cases. In a marriage, for example. Parents and children, for example. Now, I understand the difference between being in public and being in private. In the West, I'm not talking about that. For example, I'm in a job that's extraordinarily extroverted. I'm an intellectual exhibitionist. I like showing off ideas. It's one of the reasons I'm a teacher. But in my personal life, I don't socialize with anyone other than my wife, except occasionally. We have some old friends. But I'm not a particularly social person in my personal life because, A, I work with people, so I like taking a break from that. And B, for my own sake, I'm not a particularly extroverted fellow. But in my job, I have to be. So there's Mr. Genorio, who you know, which is a character I play. It's real. It's me, but it is the me that's on. And then there is the me that's off duty, which is similar, but not the same. And I learned this distinction by studying the Japanese and by having Japanese friends. At the heart of Japanese society is Shinto. Now, the Japanese import Buddhism in the Middle Ages, and they adapt Buddhism, you're very welcome, to, uh, to their own society. Japanese Zen Buddhism is interesting in that it's a Buddhist Buddhism, which is somewhat pacifistic. But in Japan, the samurai's greatest enemies, who were not samurai, were not ninja, they were Buddhist monks. Up through the 1500s, monasteries of Buddhist monks would fight and beat samurai armies. Zen Buddhism became a warrior's creed. Now, if you understand anything about Buddhism from India or the mainland of Asia, you understand it's not a warrior creed. But it becomes that, please pass this back again, in Japan. But Buddhism is a veneer. It is a mask. It has certain uses in the society. But it is not the heart of Japan. The heart of Japan is Shinto. And at the heart of Shinto... Aside from living in the land of the awake gods and the physical manifestations of that in terms of the propensity in Japan for natural disasters, is the living god emperor. The living god emperor is not an exaggeration. It's not a joke. It's not a metaphor. And I don't care what Hirohito publicly proclaimed in 1947 after the defeat in World War II. <clears throat> Most Japanese, in their heart of hearts, understand that, that the emperor is the lineal descendant of Amaterasu Omikami, goddess of the sun. Amidst the Japanese people, is a living God. The purpose of the Japanese people is to serve and protect that living God. Therefore, 
the Japanese nation is able to do something that no other nation on this planet has been able to do. The Japanese conquer the Ainu, drive them up to Hokkaido, the northernmost island of Japan. They establish rice growing Yamato culture. Uh, they have a series of dynasties. They import Buddhism. The emperor fades in power. The rise of warring daimyos and lords. The rise of shoguns, who are military governors, who symbolically serve the emperor, but in fact rule the country. All of this comes to a head after the Europeans start contacting Japan in the 1500s. The Europeans bring gunpowder and cannons, and there are the three great dictators. Nobunaga, Hideyoshi, and Tokugawa Ieyasu. In 1600, at the Battle of Sekigahara, Tokugawa Ieyasu becomes shogun. The capital is moved to Edo, which is now Tokyo, eastern capital, that's what Tokyo means. And the emperor is a living god served by the shogun. And this warrior class of samurai bring 200 years of peace and stability and prosperity to Japan. And then the American squadron under Commodore Perry shows up in 1854 and reveals that the Japanese nation under the Tokugawa shogunate has failed because they've clearly fallen behind outside the powers and the gaijin, the round-eyed barbarians, that's us, had they wanted to, could have shelled the imperial pal palace or sent marines ashore to find, capture, or maybe even kill the god emperor and his children. The Japanese nation changes, turns 90 degrees. It had been isolationist, building a utopia-like society away from the rest of the world and all of its crazy influences. And now... The Japanese are going to become more Western than the Westerners. This is the Meiji Restoration, the Imperial Rescript on Education. The Japanese adopt American factories, British Navy, German Army. The Japanese start conquering parts of, uh, they conquer Korea, they conquer uh, Formosa, uh, which uh, well, they call Formosa, we call it Taiwan. They uh, conquer China in the sense that they beat China in a war, and they become one of the powers like the Europeans that go into China and basically run China uh, together through the open door policy. They beat the Russians in the Russo-Japanese War. First time an Asiatic power beats a European power in any war since the time of the Mongol Khans. In World War I, they smack the Germans around, take their colonial territory. But there's still balance through World War I. The Meiji Emperor is strong, and there is a mixture of civilian power in the form of the Prime Minister and the Cabinet, and the army, which is Prussian and samurai blended, and the navy, which is British in orientation. And all of these different powers, the imperial household, the prime minister and his cabinet, the army and the navy, share power. But in the 1920s, this changes. There's the great Quanto earthquake, which uh, practically levels Tokyo and the cities around it. And there is the accession of the emperor between the Meiji emperor and the Showa emperor, Hirohito. Uh, and the Showa Emperor's father was an idiot, mentally challenged. So there's weakness. Meanwhile, before the Showa Emperor, the Emperor Hirohito takes over in the late 20s, because of the Kwanto earthquake, because of the weakness of, of, the, of Hirohito's father, and because of the nature of a Prussian-style army, the army begins to expand its powers into the realms of the others. The army begins to actually threaten the power of the other groups. 
They threatened to take day-to-day -day running of the uh, empire from the imperial household, from the civilian government, and from the navy. Now, they do this in the name of Kokutai. Kokutai is the Japanese national spirit. It is the national Japanese spirit that talks about the unique relationship that the Japanese people have to the gods because the gods are awake and alive in Japan. I've already told you that one of the things different about Shinto is that the works of man have souls. So Senka, battleships, each battleship has a soul. Skyscrapers, each skyscraper. Factories, each factory has a soul. So it's not merely communing with trees and waterfalls. It's also communing with the battleship that you're on, or the heavy cruiser that you're on, or the tank that you're on, or the skyscraper or factory that you're in. And the bridge between these worlds is the god emperor. And the army begins to serve the god emperor despite the god emperor. And in his youth, the emperor Hirohito in the late 20s and early 30s was okay with this. Hirohito had come to believe that the allied powers at the Treaty of Versailles had treated Japan badly. The Japanese proposed an anti-racism provision to the League of Nations Charter, and the European powers denied it. The Japanese, who are extremely race proud, I say are because they are, it's not something that's in their past. The Japanese believe that they are God's, the God's chosen people, as much as the Jews, as much as the Germans, as much as anyone who ever had that kind of race pride. The Koreans have the same sort of thing. And the Japanese had been shocked that as Asiatics, they were considered to be lesser by many Europeans. More than that, um, Japanese immigrants to the United States were, uh, in their minds, uh, treated badly by the Americans. And the Japanese and the Americans have this odd relationship with one another. We and the Japanese are extremely closely connected to one another throughout Japan's modern history. So it was particularly difficult for the Japanese to have immigration limited because it seemed like Americans didn't want an influx of the yellow, the yellow peril, which was a common trope in anti-Asian racism of the time, the belief that the Asian masses would rise up and destroy Christian Caucasian Europe, the yellow peril. So there's a lot of resentment. The army is going to capitalize on this. There's also the resentment over the Washington Naval Treaty. Write this down. The Washington Naval Treaty, 1921. After World War I, the British and the Americans were beginning a new dreadnought battle cruiser race. Just as before the war between Britain and Germany, Britain and the United States were going to start competing against one another, building the most, the biggest, the best battleships. The Japanese and the um, were going to get involved in this too. And American President Warren G. Harding, State Department, decided that there was a way around this. We, the Americans, would invite the great naval powers of the world, the United States, Britain, Japan, France, and Italy, to Washington, D.C., to negotiate arms limitations, which would limit the number of battleships, battle cruisers, heavy cruisers, light cruisers, the size of those ships, the caliber of guns they could carry, basically that would regulate the size and shape of navies for the next 20 years. This was going to be a way to avoid another new naval arms race. 
and it might have prevented an Anglo-American war sometime around 1930. There are people who actually believe that. The ratio of ships is what sticks in Japan's craw. The ratio of ships is five to five to five to three to one and a half to Okay. France and Italy. One and a half battleships in this proportion. Why? Because they have responsibilities in the Mediterranean Sea. Five, the American Navy. Five, the British Navy. Three, the Imperial Japanese Navy. Now, what does this ratio mean? What does this proportion mean? It means that for every five battleships that the British and the Americans are able to keep, the Japanese will get to keep three. The French and Italians, one and a half. Now, obviously, it's not just five battleships. It's, it's, it's more like 15 or 20. But the idea is the Japanese get less. Is it because they're slant-eyed? Is it because they're yellow-skinned? Is it because they're depicted as glasses-wearing buck tooth? Oh, so sorry, mister, so sorry. <laughs> Which would drive them up a... <laughs> no. The argument is that the British Empire is a global empire that requires a multi-ocean battle force. The Americans require a two-ocean battle force. Three, really, if you count the Caribbean Sea. So we, had, we, need an we need an Atlantic fleet, a Pacific fleet, and we need to control the Caribbean in, in order to control the Panama Canal. So because of our global co commitments or multi-ocean commitments, the British and the Americans get five each. The Japanese are a dominant power in the Western Pacific. That is the only region of the world that they have to patrol or control. They don't need as many battleships as the Anglo-Saxon powers but it rankles. And this Washington Naval Treaty is going to make the Navy more willing to go along with the Army than it otherwise would. I guess what I'm saying is that without a modern fascistic or communistic or national socialistic ideology, the Japanese system is already totalitarian. It's naturally totalitarian in a way that European Christian civilization is not. Because from China, it gets the Confucian notion that the individual is a subset of the group and that group harmony is most important. From Buddhism, it gets the sense that individual vanity is not the point of life. Balance is the point of life. And from Shinto, it gets the notion that the Japanese nation must protect and glorify the God Emperor. And in the modern world, they come to conclude that that means an empire, an imperial navy, an imperial army, imperial power, conquering other countries, just like the Europeans had done before World War I. And Japan didn't really experience World War I the way the European powers did. It easily conquered the German colonies in Asia. That's it. And it escorted a bunch of ships for the British. It did not experience trench warfare. It did not go through moral pain that the trenches brought to European civilization. The Kokutai of Japan, the national spirit of Japan, was an aggressive service, unitarian service to the emperor. State Shinto becomes the basis of education and the basis of imperial government. Now, militarism. The Japanese, when they induct people into their military, when they draft them, are incredibly brutal. You know, because you're not stupid, that a person who goes into the US military is gonna go through hell in basic training. And that's true in most militaries. Why? 
because you train as you fight, you fight as you train. And you, the soft, self-involved, self-absorbed civilian, needs to be replaced by you, the soldier of your country. So you have to learn pain, how to live with it, how to master it, how to inflict it. You have to learn discipline, how to stay in a fight even if it'll kill you. Follow orders even though you are terrified. But in Japan, during the imperial period, during the period before the end of World War II, every single Japanese soldier, sailor, marine is beaten to within an inch of their lives on at least one or two occasions during their basic training. This is normal. Just to show them who's boss. Also to show them what they can survive, what they can build back from. In Asia, Japan and China, particularly Korea too, the raising of pre-adolescent children is much more loose than it is in the West. In the West, at least if my family and the families of others I know are any indication, children are expected to be well-disciplined. If they're not, they learn to be well disciplined. The degree of corporal punishment versus psychological punishment differs from family to family, but people, children, pre-adolescent children are expected to behave in certain circumstances. Now, some families, of course, let their kids grow wild, probably because the parents grew wild. But in civil society, we expect pre-adolescent children to learn how to behave. Buckle down. In Asian society, there's much less of that for pre-adolescent children. They allow much greater latitude. I was once driving in the back seat, or riding in the back seat uh, with my close friends uh, who had children who were American but of half Chinese descent, and my niece, who I love, who's now uh, in a doctoral program, was tapping her grandfather was from China in the head just because she was having fun. Beep, 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 beep. This went on for 20 minutes. And I eventually said, what the hell? <laughs> Rachel, stop. You're being obnoxious. But he doesn't mind. And he looked back as if to say, I don't mind. Why? Because she's just a child. They indulge it. They allow it in a way that in my family, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you go deep, they go, bam! <laughs> go, oh, sorry, I won't do that again. <laughs> In any event, this all changes when puberty comes. When puberty comes, they lower the freaking boom, and I mean hard. And this is, this is where you get a lot of the Asian stereotypes Emotional damage. There's a, there's, a, there's a guy on YouTube who, who does, and, and he's funny as heck. And he, he's right. And what it is, is Asian dad and Asian mom, you're never as good as your cousin. Your cousin, you, know, you, you, can, you can work as a, you got an A. Why not A plus? And what that is all about is there is a shock that a kid goes through. And that shock changes them to the compliant adult that they're supposed to be. But that change is a betrayal. People who had been happy, cute little teddy bears suddenly become giant predatory polar bears or grizzly bears. It's, oh, you're playful, roly poly. <laughs> you learn. Don't trust certain things. And that, coupled with the beating, creates in the typical Japanese soldier a constant wellspring of rage that they can use to climb the hill when they're exhausted, to do the bonsai bayonet charge to die fighting for their emperor. In effect, every Japanese soldier who goes to the army has a funeral. They go around before they are going to leave for camp with the thousand knot belt. It's a special belt that only military recruits can wear. And every time a woman passes, 
The woman is supposed to stop, bow, thank the guy for his service, and tie one of the knots. And by the time he goes off to war, he will have a thousand knots, and each knot represents the hopes and love of a woman, and that's lovely. <clears throat> there was a Japanese who, after World War II, was talking about this, said, you know, I'd like, I would have loved it if one of those women had shared her body with me, because at least I would have had that before I go off to war and probably die. But no, I got the knots. That's, that's the culture. That's the culture. Of course, the Japanese army did have following it comfort women uh, that were basically for the purpose of entertaining males in the battle zone. Um, we never did that. The, the American army, uh, the Russian army, to my knowledge, uh, the, the German, we did not have a bunch of uh, women organized by the military to offer comfort. Yes? Um, my master, he, he tells a story a lot. When he was a kid uh, in Taekwondo, when he was a kid, his, like he, like you said, like was just like all rowdy and his mm -hmm. parents didn't really care much. Yeah. And then um, he got like, basically every kid goes through some sort of martial arts training. Mm -hmm. And so then he was like, he went into that. And within the first day, that kid, like this little five-year-old boy was getting feet with the yeah. Like a piece of wood. It's yeah. just because, like, you learn. the parents, the, if the parents don't teach them discipline, the martial the martial art does. Yeah, the sensei. And that's well, that's why, like, they're so good at martial arts is because that's that's their life. And so, like, the demonstration teams, mm -hmm. well, first they have to go through, like, a year of dance. They also have to go through, like, a year of gymnastics. And then their school, they do school there. They, they mm -hmm. learn for, like, an hour, and then the rest of the day is practicing tech. That's, that's really good. Dude, I'm so <laughs> Trying to pick the national origin of Taekwondo. Kwondo. Is it Korean? Korean. Thought so. When Buddhists in Asia meditate, it's not, you know, hang out, listen to hippie music, smoke some incense, or sniff it or whatever. You got an old guy walking around with a stick. And if you even slouch, bam! You get woken up. Um, quickly, yeah. And they would get like punished by doing push ups, and they have to do it on their knuckles. And if they didn't go down far enough, they would either whip their. Well, they would either whip their back or their hands, and mm -hmm. every time you go down, you have to say thank you, like some of them. Yes. Oh. So, what I'm saying is, <laughs> Japanese soldiers of this era are literally created to have a deep wellspring of rage, and that's going to come out when we do the war. Uh, we will get to uh, Geiko Kujo next time. Thank you for your attention. It is a privilege to fight. <laughs> yeah? Oh, I just want to have a uh, comment to say. So we had a Korean exchange student. It was really interesting because... So she, she was absolutely a nightmare. Mm -hmm. But there was a huge um, difference between the younger children and the ones that were about 13 old. The ones that were, like, younger, you're like, oh my gosh, these are brats. Like, yes, they, they, yeah. And but then it was really interesting because the people that, like, um, especially I, I, girls and guys, they were, like, 13 mm -hmm. or older. They were very, like, they were respectful. They had, it's like they were older Because than of this been, sudden but, change. Yeah, and so, like, I didn't, at the time, I didn't know why, but I was yeah. like, wow. every single child just get, like, a huge, like, beat down at some point? Because yes. you would go from one extreme to the other. Yes. And it was really interesting. No, no, it is. And I personally having, I saw that my best friend's wife try to raise the kids that way. I saw my best friend try to raise, raise in the Western style. Mm -hmm. And so they had a bit of both. But I always thought it was, from my point of view, psychologically cruel to set the kid up. Oh, indulge, 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 indulge. Yeah. I love that so much. Because <laughs> you're evil. I mean, yeah. Thank you. Come again.